happy Saturday. So yeah, my name's Grace. I wanted to just do a quick video today where I did a wrap up of my reading for the booktube prize for nonfiction. Um, I judged nonfiction group G for the octafinals. And so I have six books to go through um, with my rankings and my thoughts on each book. And I also wanted to talk a little bit first about my ranking criteria and, you know, what sort of um, criteria I use to think about these books because they're all quite different from each other and there are also a number of, of different kinds of nonfiction that I don't necessarily read very regularly. So I wanted to have some type of um, criteria so that not that not that I would take like a fully objective stance because I don't think that that's completely possible, but I could maintain some level of neutrality if there was a book that I really disliked reading, but found to be, you know, reflective of its genre in a, a positive way or, you know, something along those lines. So I wanted to have some standards for judging, um, which is why I kind of created some criteria for myself and I'm going to walk through that briefly and then talk about each of the books and some of my main thoughts on them. So in terms of ranking criteria, um, the things that I decided upon were basically um, five different sort of like areas that I would be thinking about as I read these books. So the first one is authorial voice. Um, I wanted to think about is the authorial voice consistent with the story being told? Does it make sense to this story, right? Is it, is it a good pairing? Um, is it a clear authorial voice? Does it seem authentic to this writer and their background and their perspective? Um, so those were my questions that I used when I was thinking about authorial voice. I also thought about writing quality. Um, does the writing have nice prose? Does it flow well? Is the quality of writing um, particularly readable or particularly clear to, you know, to a reader? Structure and organization of ideas was my third criteria that I wanted to think about. So questions that I asked when I was thinking about this area uh, were, do the ideas flow well? Does the organization make sense for the work as a whole? Um, I think that that area in particular, I obviously I care about authorial voice and I care about writing quality in nonfiction, but I do think structure and organization of ideas is one of the most critical aspects of um, well-written nonfiction. And so I wanted to make sure that that was a main kind of part of what I, I took into consideration. Um, the thesis, so I was looking for is there a central point or an argument that is well articulated? Some of these books are memoirs, so they may not have really like a standard thesis um, in the sense that, you know, a, more of a like a historical work or um, a work of science might have a specific thesis. But I was still looking to see, you know, is there... Um, like an argument or a sort of a point and a, a reasoning behind the things that are being shared in the memoirs as well. Um, I was also wondering, you know, is there a central point or argument and is it well articulated? Are there holes in the argument? Does it feel like a point that serves the subject or the field in which that, that work stands? So those were some of the questions I asked for the thesis. Um, piece of things. And then finally, I, I wanted to think about, you know, is this engaging to a lay person? Could it capture the attention of someone who's new to the subject or to the field? I think that that's really important when talking about nonfiction, when thinking about nonfiction critically as a reviewer. Um, a book doesn't need to be captivating to a lay person in order to be an effective work, um, certainly. But in, in terms of judging for a prize where it's more about like uh, a broad, a broader audience and appealing to kind of a broader audience. I think it is important that a nonfiction work um, capture the attention of someone who is potentially new to the subject or trying to learn about that subject by, you know, picking up that that work in particular. So, um, from my understanding, none of the books in the book two prize are specifically like academic texts. They're not 
I, I haven't seen that a lot of the books are published by university presses in particular. So when I think about um, nonfiction that is published in a more sort of uh, popular format, right, by, by major publishers, we're thinking about that reaching a larger audience. So that was something I wanted to consider as well. So those were my ranking criteria. Now, in addition to that, obviously, you know, I have my own background, my own perspective, my own thoughts about each of these works. And I do want to provide some context of my um, sort of like where I'm coming from when I was thinking about these these books that way, because I think that's important. And it also goes along with some of my critiques of some of these books. Um, I don't know that people always provide um, background on themselves <laughs> and sort of think about their context for um, reviewing works or, or for thinking about works. And I don't know that authors always think about their position or their background when they're writing nonfiction. And I think that that is um, really essential to, to a well-written nonfiction work to have that sort of uh, self-awareness and to provide the audience with some of that context as well so they can consider where your beliefs may differ from their own, where your background might give you certain perspectives that they might not agree with or that they may differ from, right? So I think that's important. So to give you a little tiny bit of context about me and my background, I have an undergraduate degree in anthropology and environmental science, so a dual major um, in the social sciences and the physical sciences, hard, hard science, right? Environmental science. Um, and so really, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a perspective of someone who thinks about things with both that social science lens and that natural science lens as well um, when I'm reviewing nonfiction. And I also have a master's degree in political science um, and a background working in higher education. So I do have a lot of comfort dealing with nonfiction um, that is both well-written and also nonfiction that is very inaccessible um, in, in the way that it's written. And um, I've read a lot of social science nonfiction and I've read a lot of um, nonfiction about the environment um, and the hard sciences and, and things like that. So I, I have kind of both of those perspectives coming into this. I don't have a strong um, background in history in particular. Um, I'm not trained, you know, specifically in uh, historical research or in those fields. And I don't personally read a ton of pure history um, in my day-to-day -day sort of reading. I read a lot of texts that deal with political problems, social issues, um, nature, the environment, things like that. So um, some of the history that I was reading for this prize was a little bit outside of my comfort zone, um, but we'll kind of get there as we're talking about it. So I figure I'll actually start with my least favorite and kind of work through to my most favorite. Um, I was, first of all, extremely pleased with the picks that I got uh, in terms of Group G. I feel like I, I really, really um, lucked out <laughs> with, with this set of, of books. And um, my, even my, my worst pick from this list, even the one that I just liked pretty strongly, actually, I ended up giving a three star. So the, the book that I gave a three star to is A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds by Scott Whitensall. Um, and this is really a, a science and nature nonfiction book um, that basically focuses on the most recent science of bird migration in particular. So the bird follows people who are tracking and obtaining this information about birds, both scientists and conservationists, and also lay people and hobbyists who, who do this work. Um, 
Widensall himself, I, I did go back and do research on pretty much each of these authors as I was thinking about the books and writing about my experience with the books. And Widensall himself has a journalism background. That's kind of how he came into the field. But he is a, a hobbyist and he works in conservation as well at this point. And he has been working in it for so long. I don't think that that's his main um career specifically. I don't think that that's how he makes his money, but it seems like he's very deeply involved in conservation and is a birder and is very invested in the science um, and well connected within the field. And so he does have a kind of an interesting background in that he works with a lot of the people um, frequently within this field, has been on many different types of birding and conservation related trips around the world. And so in this book, he basically takes you through his um, experiences as a field researcher. And there, there's a, a lot of expertise in this book. There's a lot of technical details and descriptions of field work that um, he's done. And he, he really does do, I would say, a, an impressive job of telling a compelling story about some of the scientific details and some of the phenomena related to birds. In particular, some of the science just related to um, sort of like the physics behind migration. Um, to be honest, some of it is, you know, above my my pay grade when it comes to my understanding of like quantum <laughs> physics, quantum entanglement and things like that. But he does sort of like delve into that a little bit. There's interesting things related to gravity and tracking of certain bird species. Um, and even just like the preparation of certain birds for migratory voyages was really interesting to read about. I, I do very much enjoy that kind of science and I do personally really like birds as well. I like watching them. Um, so that was very interesting to me. I did consume this book on audio and it was um, pretty easy to tell that the prose was readable, um, good quality, you know, very, I would say, it, it pretty standard in terms of um, pop science journalism, right? Like if you were to pick up um, a Discover magazine or, you know, Nature magazine or something like that, like a con even a conservation newsletter where people were talking about those things, there is a um, prose quality that, that's quite accessible, right? It's not really overwhelmingly technical or overwhelmingly detailed. Um, and the chapters do build upon each other and they reference prior concepts. Um, although I will say the the thesis of the book felt rather vague to me, right? Um, I said in my written review that the book is 400 pages, but I, I couldn't find any real arguments or strong recommendations that the author seemed to want to share in this book. And to be honest, that's where a lot of my sort of issues came in to this book. Um, I think that, you know, really the kind of the, the issues I had with this is that Wyden and Saul seemed to want to take a very journalistic approach to chronicling something that he is deeply involved in personally, and that he also pretty clearly from the book has strong feelings and opinions about. And in doing that, in taking what I imagine he believes is more of like an objective writing approach to it, I think he missed some of the actual critical arguments about the science of bird migration and the science of conservation as well. Um, you know, in particular, I, the while the scientific material itself is accessible, um, I think that he really leaves out um, a lot of important additional information <laughs> that would have made this book even more impactful. And so I was surprised to see that this actually got through to the next round. Um, so, you know, really like one, some of my main issues with this is that it, it got me heated because he would sort of share scientific ideas in the book but I found them in many ways critically flawed and incomplete in their diagnosis of the causes of bird species collapse. So in particular, you know, he, he takes us through trips kind of across the world and he'll give you some background for the conservationists who 
you know, I'm going to say it, are primarily white men <laughs> in this book, right? Um, and often wealthy white men who are doing this as a, a hobby. So tr traveling as a hobby and working in bird conservation or bird science, um, migratory science. And they're going to places where primarily non-white, poor people live. And then basically saying, like, we should be conserving these bird species here. Like, it's awful that humans are doing these things in these areas. Why, you know, why is this war going on and, like, ruining this area? Or why is there so much crime in this region that's, like, ruining the environment? Or why don't people understand that if they, you know, use all their natural resources, they're going to destroy, to destroy all the nature around them? To be fair, like, that that argument just really pissed me off in this book. Um, because my response to that is like, duh, we, you know, a lot of those places have been colonies. Um, there's been imperial capitalism of many kinds that has wreaked havoc in those areas. It's not like la-di-da white people in the United States are so good at conserving birds, right? Like, it, it's a very, um, sort of wealthy and privileged white male lens for thinking about conservation science. And I think that in that, it really misses the mark in terms of its recommendations. Um, Widensall really fails to get into much discussion of gl global climate change, of the impact of, um, you know, disaster capitalism, essentially. Uh, the impact of, you know, offshoring lots of different kinds of like natural resources extraction um, and extractive policies in other countries. He sort of ignores all that. And there are even parts, I mean, there was a part I was listening to the book where I had to stop and I got, I was getting angry listening to this part where he recounts a specific conservationist who's working in Africa um, and has worked there for like many, many years with groups of conservationists going back frequently to do research. And they started lamenting the fact that there are, there's the possibility that they might be kidnapped and held for ransom. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I would say, like underlying racism surrounding that kind of commentary without any self-awareness that you are a wealthy person stepping into someone else's country where people are in distress and they are willing to kidnap people for money. Like that doesn't just happen because people want that to happen. That happens because people are being exploited, right? So um, I had a lot of issues with this book. I'm frankly a bit surprised that it moved on, but at the same time, it was one of the two books by white men in this, this category. And so I'm not that surprised that it moved on, but I ranked it at the bottom of my rankings because although some of the science was interesting, the writing was, you know, fairly strong, if fairly simplistic. Um, I felt like the authorial voice was, was not strong. There wasn't, or it was strong, but it was strong in a way that was not positive. Um, there were some major questions left open and some major areas that were left undiscussed that made um, the thesis and sort of the the general subject of the book and its structure and sort of impact very questionable to me. So I'm really not interested in reading more from this author and, and that's kind of my thoughts on that. I'm going to jump ahead to my favorite book because I, I just want to spend more time on this one because it, it didn't move on. And so I'm, I'm pretty sad about that because this book was a total surprise to me that it ended up being my favorite. And um, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about it. And so I think it's, it's important for me to promote it um, in this video because I'm the first person that I've heard talking about this book and I think it was fantastic. So my favorite and a book that I did get, end up giving five stars um, that was a surprise favorite for me is All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, A Black Family Keepsake by Taya Miles. Um, and this book won the National Book Award. So I probably shouldn't have been surprised, but I honestly haven't 
heard much about it at all. Um, and again, like I said early on, I don't read a lot of history specifically, like just straight history works. So um, I sometimes find them kind of boring. Honestly, I, I just don't pick them up very frequently because of that. I do like I've loved historical fiction. I love um, some specific books about certain like periods in history or certain ideas or, or you know, political things that occurred in history. But general history, I don't pick up very frequently. But this book, I think, is a really super creative and interesting take on um, really like reconstructing the way we think about history in the United States, especially surrounding indigenous peoples and enslaved peoples and their histories. So um, I'm, I'm sad that it didn't move on because I think it was really excellent. Basically, this book follows the story of a family keepsake. Um, it was a, specifically like a cotton sack that an enslaved mother gave to her daughter, Ashley, before they were separated um, and before her daughter was sold away to an, another um, slave owner, basically, in the South. So it's a very heart-wrenching, um, very impactful kind of story crafted around looking at this particular historical artifact and then doing a lot of analysis of um, different types of slave narratives, um, you know, literary information from that time, all kinds of records, records from slave holders in the South for that region to sort of like understand trends and um, decisions that may have impacted these women. So I think the biggest thing in here that may, might have downgraded it for other people is that it is a, a reconstructive history, right? It, it has to be somewhat creative in the way that Taya Miles tells this story because by its nature, we do not have written records the same way we do for many other um, groups of people that we do from the perspective of enslaved peoples and a lot of indigenous peoples in the United States. And Taya Miles herself is um, a black and indigenous woman um, and historian. So that, you know, she her p position within this, it, I think, and her perspective is um, useful because she does bring thinking from those traditions and those backgrounds into this discussion. She brings in... Um, thinking about spirituality within the context of the time and the place. Um, and she also talks about um, like family dynamics and, you know, cultural pieces. So in some ways, um, while this is a work of history, I feel like it is somewhat anthropological, right? There's There are cultural aspects that kind of come into play as well. Um, and it's very creatively sort of written in a way that I think is beginning to decolonize history, right? I, when I read this book, what struck me as particularly strong about it is that I feel like it is in some ways like a foundational text for this kind of decolonial history work that we should be doing in the United States. So um, that you know, it, it struck me as very strong in that way. I think that's very uh, unique. I haven't come across a popularly written book um, that was so well and, and clearly written for a layperson that explained those same kind of ideas because um, I just don't think that it, it's been published that way before. I've certainly come across um, journal articles and others who are doing decolonial anthropology, decolonial history, right? De just different kinds of decolonial research, um, but not so much for the layperson. And and to be fair, Miles herself does not use those words to describe the, the work, so I don't want to sort of place an idea upon it, but I do feel like that's kind of what this work does, and I think it's a really beautiful work for that reason and something that... Um, challenges a lot of our ideas about what is historical fact, right? Like what, 
what is fact, what is fiction, and how we understand history. So um, really in all ways I gave this book five stars. I think the authorial voice was clear and consistent. It seemed very authentic to the writer. Um, Miles was not afraid to go there <laughs> with some of the the writing and you know make it sad when it was sad and talk about evil things that were done to people <laughs> by other people right and and the ways not just that evil things were done but the ways in which those things were supported by a system behind that um, specifically of um, capitalism right and and colonialism um, imperialism really in the United States, right? So, so just even that whole background history of, um, coming here, taking land, removing people from that land, either pushing them out to other lands in a way, or enslaving the indigenous population, which happened and which she recounts in this story in some detail, and then also bringing people in, stealing them from another land, to do work, right? Um, to, to labor and to build build the land and to build wealth for specific people. And I think what, you know, one thing that is particularly interesting in this story is she starts in the present with um, the, the discovery of Ashley's sack, right? By, by a woman, uh, I think it was at like an estate sale or some type of yard sale, right? This woman came across this and realized it may have historical significance. And it it eventually ended up in the hands of um, a historical society that is basically at um, a plantation home, right? And the collection is the family collection for that plantation. So it, in many ways, it's um, kind of a, a stark uh, e example of how we continue to sort of like extract from certain groups and maintain ownership of certain information, that collection realized that that sack had historical value and it's owned by that collection, but it has been lent out to the Smithsonian at this point and that's where it is. And Miles even says at the beginning of the book, you know, does it really make sense for this black mother's gift to her enslaved daughter that has been maintained in a black family over time to eventually fall into the hands of a collection um maintained by you know the the family the estate of former enslavers who who might have held her R really interesting historical questions right really interesting questions about how we do history who owns items and artifacts um, the ownership of the narrative surrounding those items and artifacts and the sort of, you know, idea of the historical record and how real it is in many ways. Um, and who gets to control the narrative that is maintained over time versus, you know, these competing narratives that are sometimes just maintained through storytelling or through family um, heirlooms and, and shared items, right? And I think that's a, a big thing at the heart of this work is this concept that a lot of enslaved peoples and a lot of indigenous peoples didn't necessarily um, write, right, or read specifically uh, by design in, in many cases. And so there are rarely written, maintained written records that are particularly from their perspective. And so this is an item where there is a written record um, sewn into this sack by a descendant of the women who um, initially had that interaction, right? And maintained in a way that really speaks to like the love and the bond and the humanity um, at the heart of the story. And I think that in that way, the book really blew me away. I bought this book on audio and I highly recommend that way of, of um, consuming this book, but I would also definitely recommend picking up a physical copy because I think there are pictures of the sack itself and more information, more details about the physical object. Um, and I'm I probably will pick up a physical copy um, for myself because I just loved it so much. 
So we're already getting um, deep into this discussion, but I've touched upon my favorite and my least favorite books. So let's kind of work through the other ones because honestly, the rest of them I enjoyed quite a bit. Um, I think the one that I rated second, yep, definitely the one that I rated um, my second highest that did make it its way through. Um, this was the only one in my top three in terms of my rankings that made its way through. And I knew that this was going to get voted through is Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty by Patrick Radden Keefe. Um, this one, I was never going to get it from my library, but the same for Ashley's sack, actually, the, um, all that she carried, both of those books I had to purchase because they were just on hold for, for so long. So I'm glad to see that people are reading that book <laughs> because I think that's so beautiful. And this book is also fantastic. And I completely understand why people love Patrick Radden Keefe. Um, this is, it's just such a fun book to read. I hate to say that it's a fun book to read because the subject matter is dark and truly chronicles a, a family that I think has done great evil um, in our society in a lot of ways, but it, it is bingeable. It reads like um, true crime, really. And there's, you know, I don't, I don't read a lot of true crime, but there are a few books that I've read over the past couple of years that I found had the same sort of like juicy readability as this book, I would say. Um, and they kind of like fall into that true crime genre. And so I think that this is, it's, this does sort of fall into true crime, but it's more almost like true white collar crime. <laughs> if you had to put it in a, in a, um, in a category that way. So yeah, so basically, um, you know, I figured this was going to make its way through. I don't think there's a lot that I can say about this book that probably hasn't been said. But what I will see is that, say is that um, Patrick Radden Keefe re writes extremely well. The structure and the sort of cogency of this book, the way that it is um, built as a, as a book that kind of takes you through the history of this family and all the way down to the fact that like you have this family tree right in the front of the book um, is so well crafted. You need that family tree because you're gonna, you know, as you're reading this book, you're gonna be sitting there being like, ooh, which member of the family is this? And like going back and sort of trying to figure out like all the threads that lead up to the original group of brothers that started, um, sort of the whole Sackler dynasty, essentially. And I think it is really critical reading at this time, um, in particular, because clearly it's still an ongoing story, right? That was my major critique of this book. And that was why it didn't make my absolute top pick, um, is that this story is ongoing. And so while Rad and Keith gave you some good, um, some excellent background and some excellent details about the family, which I don't think have ever really been this accessible to a lot of people before by design, because the family is very secretive about their background and the work that they do while also weirdly plastering their name all over the world um, in, in a, a creepy sort of industrialist way. Um, he he makes it very readable. He makes it very interesting to understand that family dynamics and to think about, you know, the choices that are, were being made within the company and how much culpability they have in the opioid crisis in the United States, which is, you know, they have a lot of culpability. <laughs> Spoiler warning, they have a lot. So um, I think my biggest complaint, though, is that, you know, by the time he finished this book, there still are things that are ongoing with the court cases and with, you know, payouts from the family and things like that. So he wasn't really able to wrap it up in a very, I think, in a very strong way at the end. And so I felt kind of left like, mm, okay, like, I think the story you told is fantastic. And I kind of wish that maybe it had um, a stronger conclusion, right? But that's not really his fault. In, in effect, that's not his fault. And he even says in the book, that he hopes that his sort of like in-depth research and background history for this family is the beginning of the stories that we tell about this um, 
this crisis and the sort of decisions that were made within that company that led to it. So I think that he's aware of the fact that the book didn't have a strong wrap up in that way. Um, and that it's not his fault. Um, I do think one of my other sort of issues with this book is that in really focusing on the Sackler family, um, which I think is is necessary. Like I, I don't disagree with that focus for this book. And I think he builds a strong and compelling thesis for why it's necessary to focus on the Sackler family. And particularly while they're hiding lots of things about themselves, why we should be focused on digging it up <laughs> and paying attention to it, right? If the people are doing bad things, they're probably not talking about those things and they might be covering them up. So um, I think that his reasoning for doing that makes total sense. On the flip side, I think that this is an issue that I have with sort of like true white collar crime books, which is a genre I really enjoy in general. So I'll give you a couple examples. I read um, Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and Conspiracy, and A Conspiracy to Protect Predators by Ronan Farrow. And I read We Keep the Dead Close, A Murder at Harvard and a Half Century of Silence by Becky Cooper. Um, and both of those books follow like conspiracy within corporations or institutions and systemic abuse that goes on, right? So I think this is also very related to that, right? The, con con the sort of conspiracy, the sort of work within corporations to keep that on the down low or to take advantage of people and the sort of systemic abuse that can result from that. I think a problem with the focus on... Um, the Sackler family in this book and something that I wish he had spent a little bit more time discussing in the story is that it it sort of like lets all of the people who worked for that family and enabled the evil that that company did kind of off the hook a little bit. And I don't think he did that on purpose because even in referring to his notes on sources section at the end of the book, um, he had an, a, a quote where he said he felt like he was witnessing a collective amnesia from the people he interviewed who worked at Purdue Pharma. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, but I do wish that we had a little bit more of um, a story that delves into that, right? And like, what is it about our society that people just let these things happen within institutions and systems and don't challenge them? Um, even when, you know, they could probably go work for a different company, right? Or there are, there are certainly people who could find a better job. It didn't sound like it was a particularly awesome job to work at Purdue Pharma. Like, yes, in the sales roles, I can sort of understand why people would um, potentially stay in those roles, especially if they came from a lower earning role in the past and they were able to make a lot of money in sales roles. But in terms of like the day-to-day -day running of the pharmaceutical company, those jobs sounded like a horrible grind with awful kind of abusive management. <laughs> and so like as someone who has worked for organizations in the United States that are varying levels of like unethical, I would say. Um, I think that I just have lots of questions about why people continue to do that and why there's kind of like less uh, interest in challenging what's going on and just sort of going along with it. And I think that that's a cultural problem that we have to address if we're going to deal with these systemic issues, right? Because it, it is at its heart a systemic problem that enables individuals to exploit people. So that that's the piece that I guess I felt like was missing from this book. But overall, such a good story. I read it so quickly. I mean, it's a thick book and I read it really, really quickly and I very much enjoyed it. Would highly recommend it. The book that I rated third um, in my list was a memoir. It was Punch Me Up to the Gods by Brian Broom. This one, I was very, again, I was very surprised that this came in to my top three. I wasn't really expecting it to be in my top three. Um, and I probably wouldn't have picked this book up if I hadn't been reading it for the BookTube Prize. Um, it is a memoir and it does not shy away from 
some very difficult subjects, including um, abuse from family, struggles with sexuality, and struggles with addiction in particular. Um, Broom deals with different types of um, drug and alcohol addiction throughout the story. He also um, deals with, you know, coming out to himself as well as others in his life um, and sort of reckoning with his sexuality and dealing with um, an abusive, quite an abusive parent, um, sort of like actively physically abusive in terms of his father and then, you know, varying kinds of emotional abuse from both parents, I would say, um, especially surrounding his sexuality when he was a child and before he had kind of come to terms with his sexuality. Um, this is really the first memoir of this kind that I've read. And so, and particularly from the perspective of, of a black man who grew up in kind of a rural area in Ohio. Um, and so I think, you know, part of what I really enjoyed about this book is that it was just a different perspective than what I usually hear. And I think that it was um, well-crafted and well-written the memoir is sort of built around this framing device where Broom is in um, a bus kind of traveling through his city that he lives in now. This And it, it seems like this is kind of present day or, or close to present day framing. And a black man and his young black son get on the bus and there's kind of a series of interactions between them and between the young black boy and the people around him that um, Broom witnesses during this bus ride. And as he sort of like witnesses what this little boy is experiencing or what he imagines this little boy is experiencing, he will then go into um, kind of a vignette about his own life and some experience that he's had um, when he was a young black boy and then also as a black man. Um, I think that, you know, there was a lot about this book I really enjoyed. I will say in terms of like reading experience, I read this after I read um, Somebody's Daughter by Ashley C. Ford. And both of these books I enjoyed very much and they each could have gone into this slot, into this third slot, right? They're, they're both really good. They were very close in terms of my, my thoughts about them. Um, I think that what set this book apart for me is that Broom really does not shy away from his own like bad behavior, his own, you know, shame, his own uh, cowardice at times, right? Like he, he really, for a memoir, he really reckons with um, self-reflection in a way that I think was stunning in this book tr like truly stunning um really strong and I I do think that his perspective is really interesting in that way and I also think in memoir we don't always get someone who's willing to talk about like when they, their their worst moments right the worst things that have happened to them um and in, in some ways it made it not an enjoyable experience to read this book it was quite painful to read this book at times but um I think that it because of that it sort of like edged ahead of the other memoir um, because he really was willing to kind of go there <laughs> with you um, and take you through some moments that you know I guess I appreciate because I will never experience anything similar to that so it gives me a perspective that I don't have access to um, in that way. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed this one. I think, you know, there was one, um, really strong chapter in particular that I mentioned in my written review that I think will stay with me because at the time it, it wasn't as intense or painful as a lot of the other chapters. I was honestly having trouble getting through this book because it was quite painful. His story is very painful and, and dark. <laughs> um, and it was kind of a lot. I'd read a lot that was similar at that point. So I, I was feeling a little wrung out. But this story in particular really struck me. And I think it was really um, evocative of the rest of the collection. He 
recounts the story of when he's an adult meeting a white man who um, is from a, a different country, not the United States, in a bar. And the white man is, you know, starts hitting on him. They start kind of flirting with each other. And that man sort of makes an assumption that Brian Broom plays basketball. Um, and you can assume that it, you know, it is a racist assumption, right? It's an assumption based on the way he looks and the fact that he's black and maybe what he was wearing that day, right? Things like that. Um, and Broom just leans into it, even though he hasn't played basketball since he was a kid. He's like, whatever, I'm attracted to this guy. Like, he thinks that that's attractive, that I would play basketball. So I'm just going to go with it. I'm not going to, like, make a fuss or challenge him about it. I'm just going to, like, go go along with it and pretend that I play basketball. And what you do see is a bit of, like, a slow motion car crash where they continue that relationship for a month or, or more, it seems like. And then there's an incident where the guy basically is like, you know, here's your moment, we're gonna play basketball. And Brian Broom can't play basketball and he's very bad at it. And so the lie unravels, right? His lie about being a basketball player. But I think what was really interesting about this chapter in particular is that right at the beginning of that conversation, um, the other man says something about like, I'm so sorry that you have to deal with racism in your country. And sort of like some one-off line about racism here in the United States. Um, and sort of like removing himself from that concept of being racist, right? Or living in a society that has racist ideas that he may perpetuate himself. And so by the end of the book, even though you're kind of like, oh my gosh, Brian, like, why would you lie about this? This is ridiculous. And you're, you know, he's going to get himself in a pickle because of this lie. You also feel a lot of empathy for this guy for, you know, just not even wanting to like open that can of worms and fight with somebody about this idea like and just wanting to go along with being attractive to this person and I think that was very a very relatable story and also you know at the end he never makes excuses for himself and says like I you know I lied because I didn't want to deal with the, his racism or whatever um, or because I wanted to use his racism to my benefit or, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but you do get that picture of like, wow, this person is dealing with these, I guess I would call them like microaggressions, but they, they have such a, an ongoing impact on their relationships with other people in a way, um, that just, really pushes them into these like racist stereotype boxes and particularly as a gay black man wanting to be attractive to other men he seems to feel this need to like perform masculinity in a certain way that other people expect and I think that you know as a a like white woman sometimes I feel like I have to perform femininity in ways to either be attractive or to be safe, right, in, in different contexts. So that was just a really relatable chapter and one that I thought was um, really strong from that book. So the next book that was on my list was Somebody's Daughter, like I said, by Ashley C. Ford. Another one that got picked, and so I'm very glad with that, that choice to the top of the ranking because, like I said, on any given day, I think the... Brian Broom book or the Ashley C. Ford book could have switched places. Um, I really, I, and that's not to say that they're the same book because I think I want to be intentional about saying that they offer very different perspectives, very different takes, while there are some overlaps in terms of, um, you know, queerness and sexuality being discussed, um, sort of the experience of being a, a Black child raised in a more rural American area, um, definitely, you know, dealing with violence and abuse, um, sexual violence, things like that. All of those things, there are similar themes, but they offer quite different, um, quite different perspectives and different kinds of takes on those things. Um, Somebody's Daughter is, you know, is beautiful. I listened to this on audiobook. This was the first book that I read for this, this judging category. And I 
I really enjoyed it and I thought the writing was really strong. Um, and I thought it was very smooth too. I think my biggest critique of this book is that it could feel a bit sterile at times. It could feel a bit removed. But I think that that was the intention of the author because throughout the story she writes about events that have led to dis disassociative behavior from herself. And so I think um, the book itself is written in a way where you sort of fall into almost like a feeling of, of disassociation <laughs> with the story and then come out of it. And I will say again, you know, like the Brian Broom book, many, many, many trigger warnings for this book. There is an on page assault um, of her when she is a child in this story um, that is, is very, very hard to read. And then there's a lot of abuse from her mother and she's also dealing with um, her father's incarceration throughout the story um, and at later times she deals with um, you know her own queerness and sort of really like processing her trauma in different ways um, in, in this book but I thought it was very well written um, really strong Again, like a lot of information that I think is um, very relatable. There were even some scenes in this book. I mean, some of the things that actually still stand out to me was the way that she captured certain moments of childhood where maybe you're dealing with like a great sadness or, um, or actual trauma or actual abuse, but you escape to the playground and, and just swing on a swing, right? And that was something like, there were moments in this book when I was reading it and I was like, that is very, very, very relatable um, to f being a child and sort of the way that I think children sometimes process those things and um, don't always process them and maybe use other things to kind of escape and, and disassociate. So I thought that was a great book. I am glad that it was picked and that it moved on. Um, as well. And I think, it, you know, it's very strong. And then my final book, my final um, book, which was second to last, but also very, very strong, in my opinion, um, is The Agitators, Three Friends Who Fought for Abolition and Women's Rights by Dorothy Wickenden. This book, again, this was a surprise to me, because this is a, this was a history book um, that follows three friends um, in the lead up to the Civil War and then through the Civil War. And the three women are um, Harriet Tubman is the most famous and then Frances Seward, who was the right wife of um, Henry Seward, I think, who was Lincoln's Secretary of State and one of the, the team of rivals. Um, and then Martha Wright, who was another woman who was involved in abolition and women's rights causes. And they all lived in, um, I think in Syracuse, New York at that time. I can't recall, but I think it was in Syracuse, New York, that certain area of New York. Um, and it takes, a, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It takes a chronological chronological approach to the storytelling. Dorothy Wickenden is a journalist by trade, not a historian. And so I think while this was very interesting and there were a lot of aspects of the story that I thought were strong and um, intriguing new takes on especially like the involvement of women in these movements during that time, um, I also felt like Wickenden may have been nervous in terms of like challenging the status quo when it comes to per doing history work. And because of that, this book was missing some nuance to me. So for instance, you know, we're following these three women. Obviously, Harriet Tubman is the most famous and probably the biggest draw in terms of the name on the book. Um, but we get the least information about her as a historical figure and we kind of get like the least uh story about her we also don't get a lot a, a ton about martha wright i would say you know probably um two-thirds of the book is focused on francis seward and henry seward in particular and their families and then kind of the rest of the book is an, an interweaving of martha wright and harriet tubman so in that way, you 
you know, it, it, it's really kind of built around the men who had the, who were sort of the most famous. And by, by association, the wife of the man who was most famous um, out of that group and sort of the records that are related to that family because of that and that have been maintained. And I think that, again, from the perspective of doing history, that makes sense. And if Wickenden had written about the process of doing the research and what she found in the record and how she found it and where it was and why it was preserved, I think that would have added like a really interesting metacognitive element to this history that would have taken it up a notch. Because, you know, specifically with Harriet Tubman, there's no discussion of the fact that there is no written record by Tubman herself. Um, all records of her from other people. There are no letters between her and others. She was a, and she was could not write, um, and and could not read from my understanding within this book, and so all records of Tubman are either like uh, by other people about her or based on things that she said. Uh, you know, in theory, it her you know her um, story was told to someone else and they wrote it down. But there's no way to confirm that it was accurate because she couldn't read it. So unless you're going to be completely trusting of the person writing it down, um, we really don't have any direct information about her. And I think that that is, that's a big hole in this story because that tells you so much about that time. The fact that this like really badass woman who is really probably the most interesting woman in this story we have almost not a lot of information that is verifiable about her. Um, and also, you know, not a lot was done to really preserve what we may have had or to um, make sure that it was accurate for the time, right? And that it wasn't like out outlandish or sort of based in potentially like racist or sexist beliefs of the time. So I think that that's a, that's a big hole in the doing of this kind of history that doesn't get addressed in this story. Um, but overall, this was a fun book. This was, it was very readable. It reminded me of like, you know, younger, like children's biographies that I read as a kid in terms of like the readability and the way that I could get through the story. It didn't drag. It wasn't painful history to read, right? It wasn't too dense to get through. Um, it told a coherent story. It followed interesting people. But at the end of the day, I think the person that Wickenden found the most information on was the least interesting of the three women and the most likely to have records because of her husband, but also the least likely to be engaging in, um, you know, direct civil disobedience, like, active involvement in uh, helping people come up from the South and escape slavery or helping women to, you know, become, to gain their rights and, and, and their civil rights, right, at the time. Um, Frances Seward was really like the least involved in that story in an active way because she kind of had to keep a certain like public face. And her husband also seemed like he kind of went back and forth in terms of his actual commitment to some of the things that um, they claim to believe in, right? Like, it seemed like he was kind of wishy-washy about uh, emancipation, about providing voting rights to Black people and specifically for women. Um, he, he definitely took his political career seriously and in that way didn't take a lot of risks that I think other people may have. So um, that was that was my biggest complaint about that book. And the fact that as an author, Wickenden didn't address those holes in the record in a coherent way that gives a reader an understanding of why that might be. So not, you know, not that we um, wouldn't want more information about Harriet Tubman, but here's why we may not have good information <laughs> about her. So that's my wrap up. I don't want to be super long winded um, beyond this, but I hope that you enjoy this and, and have a good weekend.